Hello meteorology students, welcome back to Meteorology 10, Weather and Climate. This is our third lecture. Today we're going to be going over daily temperature variations. This is going to be things like daytime warming and nighttime cooling, what happens to the air at the surface, um, what farmers do to protect our, their crops, you know, um, and with, relation, with relation to you know, obviously daytime warming and nighttime cooling, um, and also temperature controls. There will be two videos um, this week, so let's get started. First of all, on a sunny, calm day, the air near the surface can be substantially warmer than the air above it. So, you know, we already talked about how we're actually warm from below. So what are the ramifications of that? That really means that if we're warm from below, that the warmest part of our atmosphere is going to be right, right at the surface due to convection. So you can see that this is going to be like a vertical temperature profile. You know, we have the temperature here on the x-axis and the altitude here on the y-axis. You know, it's going to be about 50, well over that, like 120, maybe 130 degrees um, Fahrenheit here at the surface and it rapidly, rapidly cools down. You know, this right here is only five feet. So this is going to be about, you know, the top of your head, um, maybe shoulders, I guess it depends on how tall you are, but you know, your feet and your legs, you know, are going to be down here. So really, really at the bottom most layer, right, right next to the ground, it's going to be a lot hotter than it is just, just above that, you know, just like at your shoulders or your waist level. Um, you know, we're showing you here actually with the thermometer and a shelter and, you know, we'll go over like, I think it's the second, um, video here, you know, how we actually measured temperature, you know, and the ramifications actually of this temperature profile, you know, we want it off the ground for this reason. So we'll go into that here a little bit though. Okay. So basically our temperature is going to be determined basically by which is greater, the incoming energy or the outgoing energy. So you can see here when the sun is down, you know, in the middle of the night, so 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., the outgoing energy is actually going to exceed the incoming energy. Well, there really isn't any incoming energy because the sun's out. So this is where, you know, the temperature is actually going to fall. But as the sun comes up, you can see that the incoming solar energy is going to greatly overcome the outgoing energy. And this is going to actually be where the temperature rises. Okay, you can see right here, you know, this is the time and this is going to be the energy rate on the bottom half, but on the top half will be the temperature. So at six o'clock, you know, more like four o'clock, right where they meet, right where they're about the same, okay, where the outgoing energy and the incoming energy is roughly the same. That's where we're actually going to hit our maximum temperature for the day. This generally speaking is somewhere between three and four o'clock in the afternoon. We kind of know that, right? I mean, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, it, it is pretty warm out there compared to even noon. So anyway, that's where we're going to have the highest temperature and it's just going to go down, you know, because the sun's going to, the outgoing energy all of a sudden then is actually going to exceed the incoming energy. So that means the temperature is going to start falling. This is going to be extension of, you know, this part of the graph over here until we get to the minimum of the day. And that's where they meet again. And they're actually the same. The outgoing energy and the incoming energy is going to be the same at that point. Okay? So this is going to be the minimum temperature of the day. So it, it the maximum temperature of the day is not actually noon when you might think, you know, the sun is like high in the sky. Because that's that's it doesn't give the atmosphere enough of time to warm up. Okay? It's actually going to be once that outgoing energy it starts exceeding the incoming energy, that's when we're going to hit that maximum. So this picture is actually going to show us the difference between when there's clouds in the sky and we have a clear sky um, and during the day and during the night because they're actually going to be opposite of each other. So I like to kind of look at the one without the clouds first. When there is no clouds, we do have this incoming solar, solar radiation. There's nothing blocking it. It's a warm day. You know, it hits the ground and it warms up the ground. But... At night, we have the outgoing solar radiation, which is going to be long wave, and there's nothing blocking that either. So we're going to lose all of that radiation, and it's going to go up and outside of our atmosphere, and it's going to be a cool night. When there's no clouds in the sky, the difference between the day and the night is going to be a large temperature range. 
there, there's no clouds there to block it. There's nothing, you know, to stop the radiation from coming in or leaving. And so we're going to have a really nice warm day and we're going to have a really cool um, nighttime. But if we look at it over here, when there's clouds in the sky, during the day we have this incoming solar radiation, but the clouds are actually going to block a portion of it. And so it's going to like reflect them and they're going to go out. But during the night, when we have this outgoing solar radiation, I'm sorry, not solar terrestrial radiation, it's going to come and hit the cloud, and then the cloud's going to act like a blanket, okay? And it's going to prevent it from leaving. Now, some of it will leave. You can see how some of it's leaving. But some of it's also going to come back down here to the Earth. So that's going to result in actually a warmer night than it normally would be. So during the, like um, a day and night where there's actually clouds in the sky, then we're going to have less of a di temperature difference between the day and night. Um, you know, think of, I like to think of it kind of as, like I said, as a blanket or like a shield, something like that. So it's going to, it's going to block that incoming solar radiation from hitting the ground here during the day, but at night it's going to hold it in and it's going to like keep it that way. So if you actually want it to be a cooler day during the summer, you want there to be clouds. But if, for instance, you're going tubing or you're going to the beach and you want it to be a warm day, you don't want any clouds. But at nighttime, it's going to be the opposite. If it's, you know, cooler during the winter, per se, you know, and you want it to stay kind of warm in the evening, you know, at nighttime, then you'll want, you're expecting clouds. But, you know, during the summer and it's hot during the day and you kind of really looking forward to a cooler night, you know, maybe you're looking to have a bonfire or something, um, then you're going to want to have no clouds because then that's, that radiation is going to be allowed to leave the atmosphere and it, and it won't be, you know, like blanketing us and holding that temperature down and like radiating it back down from, you know, from leaving. Okay, so here's also going to be, you know, the opposite of during the day. So we're, again, we're going to have this temperature here on the bottom and we'll have the altitude here, you know, um, on the Y axis. And you can see that the temperature here, you know, starts off at about, I don't know, 32 degrees, somewhere in there. It looks like probably close to freezing, you know, temperature here at the ground. But as you go up in the atmosphere and the altitude, it rapidly, rapidly uh, rises. You know, you can see that, you know, by the time it reaches, you know, up here, which is, you know, this is about 5.5, so about 6 feet, you know, it's already at like 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can really be a large temperature difference between, you know, at your feet than at your head. And at nighttime, because we're losing all of that radiation, it's actually going to be colder at the bottom and warmer at the top. Now, if you remember when we talked about the troposphere and that's where all weather happens, and one of the, you know, one of the things that we talked about the troposphere having is, um, you know, it gets colder with height. This is kind of opposite than that. This happens a lot at nighttime, and this is called a radiation inversion. An inversion in any context with respect to weather is going to be when you have warmer air on top of colder air. Okay, so you can see, and, and I, I probably will test you actually on inversion because this is something that, you know, even storm chasers know an inversion. An inversion is like a cap. It holds all, like no, none of the air is actually able to rise past that, you know, because at that point then, you know, the hot air wouldn't be able to rise anymore because it's the same temperature as the air above it. So it kind of acts as like a lid to anything that's rising. So temperature inversions for storm chasers is not really a good thing because it stops the, the motions going on that we're looking for. Uh, but for those of you guys that really like nice weather and, and that you don't like storms, you know, or anything like that, you know, inversions are a good thing. Um, you know, and at nighttime they set up a lot because of this, this radiation that's leaving the, like leaving. And so it causes it to actually be warmer on top of, you know, the colder air on the bottom. Now, we kind of have another thing here, which is called a thermal belt, and th this happens in, in valleys, so, you know, this would actually happen um, here, we'll, we'll, in just the next slide over, I think uh, we talk about Napa Valley, so, you know, this phenomenon is basically where that cold air is going to kind of slide down that hill, you know, into the bottom of the valley, and it creates this below freezing temperatures um, here at the bottom of the valley, and then we'll have this thing called a thermal belt right above that, which is going to be above freezing, you know, and then above the thermal belt, it'll be below freezing again. So we'll kind of have this like warm air just in the middle. So basically what that looks like is an inversion. 
Okay, it's going to be an inversion until you hit the warmest part of this thermal belt and then it'll start getting colder again. Remember, this is going to be altitude and this will be temperature. We look at a lot of these temperature profiles in meteorology. You know, this is kind of common, so I want you guys to get used to looking at these types of graphs. You know, but you can see how it gets warmer and warmer with height. If I can get my cursor to work. Um, warmer and warmer in height until it gets to a certain point where it's just the warmest part and then it gets colder and colder again. So this part right here between here and here it gets the warmest. This is actually going to be an inversion because you do have warmer air on top of colder air. So like I said, that, that's going to be kind of, um, you know, I said any type of, um, any time that you have warm air above colder air in the atmosphere, that'll be some sort of inversion going on. This is all, this is why we have these wind machines in Napa Valley. So I, since I'm from Nebraska, I wore my Nebraska shirt repping today. Um, so, you know, I went to Napa Valley, I don't know, for the first time, probably a year ago. And, you know, I've seen these in weather books, but I really had not seen one in real life until I went to Napa Valley. But, you know, I was amazed to see that they really are, these wind machines are everywhere there. So if you guys ever go there, I encourage you to, if you haven't, it's, it's beautiful there. Um, you know, you'll see these, these wind turbines, you know, all over the place. And the reason they have these is actually to mix the air so that cold air on the bottom mixes with the warm air right above it and it creates an, an like a atmosphere that is is not freezing because the grapes don't like you know freezing because then you know then they can't make wine out of it so that's not good um you know it's kind of interesting i've talked to some some winery um some guys that actually work there and they told me about how different grapes actually grow in different areas of the valleys because they might like it colder or warmer you know but they always have these at the bottom of the valleys and then the reason why is to prevent those grapes from freezing kind of cool Okay, so here is going to be these group questions. I have these in class for you guys online. Um, please pause the video, see if you can, you know, answer these. I'm going to pretend like you did, and I'm just going to move along. Okay, so the next thing we kind of go into is the controls of temperature. We have four main controls of temperature. It's going to be latitude, so how far north and south are you, the land and water distribution, ocean currents, and also your elevation. So first of all, you know, I'm going to show you guys, um, this is basically a map of the world, um, and it's going to show you the temperature differences. Um, these are contour maps. We call these contours, these lines, because they're lines of equal variable, some sort of variable. Um, this specific one is going to be an isotherm because it's a line of equal temperature. So this line right here is going to signify all, all along this line is going to be 70 degrees. It won't change, okay? Above it, it'll be colder, and below it, it'll be warmer, all right? Opposite in the southern hemisphere, it'll be warmer up here and colder on the bottom here. You can color, kind of color code it as well, so it kind of makes it visually easy for us to see. You see latitude is here going to be on the, the Y, and longitude is on the X. So it kind of gives us a nice visual representation of what's going on. But... Um, one of the things that you can see is that, you know, the further north that you go, the colder it gets from the equator. And from the equator on the southern hemisphere, the, the more south you go, the colder it gets. So that's going to be kind of our effective latitude um, on our uh, temperatures, depending on, you know, how far away you are from the equator, because the equator receives the most amount of sunlight and the most direct rays. So obviously it'll be the warmest here and the poles receive, you know, the least amount of sunlight and, and the more, you know, that beam spreading, that, that phenomenon where the, 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 um, the rays of light are kind of more spread out. So each, each area is actually receiving less solar energy. Okay. Here's actually going to be it in July as well. Um, basically you can see that we, here's going to, oh, come on, where's my cursor? You can see where our deserts here are. Now, the reason why the deserts are going to be, you know, where they are is, is they're inland here. So one of the things, you know, I think I said land and water distribution um, just a second ago is the next one here. Um, land actually has something called, is it in the next one? Yeah. So land has this thing called specific heat. Not land. I'm sorry. Land and water has specific heat. Um, you know, it's going to be the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature um, of the substance by one degree Celsius. So water takes a lot longer to heat and cool than land does. 
So the ramifications of that is that the parts that are inland here, because it takes less time during the summer, it's going to be allowed to get a lot, lot warmer because there's less energy required to actually warm up the land. So you can see that the parts like in the, in the water, you know, this is 100 degrees where this is only like 70 or 80. Okay, so this part right here is gonna, it's gonna take a lot more energy, solar energy actually for this to warm up because the specific heat is different than the land. That would be the reason why a place like Azores is gonna have more of a, a steady temperature here. You can see kind of the, this temperature profile Okay, this is going to be the Fahrenheit scale on the Y, and the month is going to be here on the X. So throughout the year, you know, it's going to have, you know, it's a summer, but it's not going to be the same as St. Louis here that's inside the land. See, this is where St. Louis is, and this is going to be the purple of St. Louis's bar. You can see that it gets a lot, lot, lot warmer here during the summer, and it gets a lot colder. There's a huge difference between the summer and the wintertime temperatures, where Azores doesn't really have that much of a, you know, actually it's only 14 degrees, where it's 50 degrees difference you know between summer and winter so the reason why is because the water kind of is surrounding it and it, it, it doesn't you know heat and cool as fast as the land does so kind of cool because you know if you really want more of a steady temperature then you're gonna want to live near an ocean kind of like we do and we don't actually receive that much of a temperature difference then in Omaha where I'm from I think last I heard from my friends it's something like 15 degrees Fahrenheit there right now and so there's obviously a huge difference um, during the summer it gets to be like a hundred degrees so there's this very huge difference between you know summer and winter there where here it's 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 like maybe 10 or 20 degrees which is why we like it here okay and then the Pacific Ocean is much cooler ocean than the Atlantic you know it's not necessarily you know um, when I say it's not necessarily cooler it's more that it's our side of it is cooler. You know, if you look at San Francisco right here, the way that the ocean currents go, and this is the, the reason why ocean currents has something to do with temperature, you know, is that it's actually going to go in a clockwise motion like this. Okay, this is the way that the ocean flows in the Pacific. And in the um, Atlantic, it does the same thing. So it's going to be kind of going like this. What that means to Richmond is that it's bringing that warm, that warm um, water from near the equator up towards the coast here. Okay, that's the Gulf Coast Stream. And right here, you can see that it's going to be bringing that cold water down from um, the north. So that's where the water's going to be cooler here near San Francisco, and it'll actually be warmer there during Richmond. That's also the reason why you can't really... Um, swim in the Pacific, but you can swim in the Atlantic. Okay, here's the second set of group questions. Like I said, I do have these for my um, live class. Go ahead and answer these if you like. This is the end of the first lecture, so um, please watch the second one, and you know, uh, I'll see you then.